All right, hello everyone. Um, as you know, my name is Stephanie Yamas and I work for Superdata, a Nielsen company. I'm very excited to be moderating this panel today about XR in marketing and sales. So without further ado, uh, let's see who our experts are. Earl, you wanna get us started? Yeah, my name is Earl Sison and I work for Thermo Fisher Scientific. Uh, we are the world leader in serving science. So we enable our customers to be healthier, cleaner, and safer. Uh, for example, we provide products and services uh, for companies that are doing something like vaccine research. And if you've had a COVID test, you may have used one of ours. Um, in terms of the company, I work with a lot of different business units creating VR, AR, XR experiences um, from start to finish. So I'm basically consulted within the company. Great, um, Brooks. Yeah, uh, my name is Brooks Clemens. I, uh, my background is in uh, behavioral science. I currently work in the measurement ROI um, portion of it. Um, I'm currently employed by Adidas. Um, however, my uh, experience with XR and my relationship within this conference specifically uh, is, is more based on um, other work that I've been doing uh, around the space. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Allie, tell us about yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Allie Blaylock. I am at Coca-Cola doing strategic marketing and um, primarily focusing on connected consumer experiences, um, all things mobile. Um, I have entered the AR space more with our Coke trademark brand team um, through a couple marketing ex executions over the past few years. Awesome. And last but not least, Alex. Hi, I'm Alex Goldberg. I'm the Senior Innovation Steward in, at REI in our Emerging Technologies Division. Uh, I work on uh, both consumer-facing uh, spatial computing solutions with a deep focus on AR, as well as internal solutions to make us better operators, leveraging uh, XR technology. Sounds great. So I'm really excited. I feel like we have a very diverse uh, set of panelists. And so, you know, I want to start with Earl. Um, it was really interesting to see uh, Thermo Fisher on the list uh, because you don't quite um, kind of traditionally tie maybe marketing and sales to something so enterprise focused. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you're doing in this space and how Thermo Fisher is taking advantage of the marketing um, aspect of XR? Yeah, I mean, in terms of a company, um, we have a lot of different teams working on different applications such as training um, and marketing, which is I, I'm very focused on, but my main use case was trade show, shows and events. So basically I would create a VR experiences with the headsets and it would be very science related, um, something where we could bring the scientists to a molecular level, such as inside the Petri dishes, uh, talking different things like organoids or stem cell research, and really having them, you know, visualize the work they're doing, which is, you know, inside the Petri dish. So with VR, we could do that. Um, in terms of AR, we are doing things like um, we have instruments, uh, for example, one instrument's a sequencer that's the size of a refrigerator. So we use that in terms of AR um, so they can project it into their labs so they could see how it fits. And then they could go through a workflow, meaning show how the instrument is used. Um, my primary focus in terms of trade shows and events, um, in the first three years, I went to about 25 different trade shows and events. And the goal was to bring people in, more lead nurturing, lead generation, and gain more interest. So. What we found when we put the headsets on, you know, put a big screen up, you know, we attracted more attention. In some cases, they were um, from the year before, maybe 107 leads generated to the trade show I went to, which encapsulated 250. So we're looking at 100% or more increase every time I use VR or XR at the event. So it, it is primarily a B2B business model, but it is really interesting where the marketing use case, trade shows and events evolved over time. Now, moving forward, we'll have to see how that works just because there's no trade shows and events anymore. They're mostly online. So 
I'll, we'll have to see how that works. But but again, in terms of the company, we have many other teams working on different things like training, um, internal training and instrument demos and different things like that. And so how do you uh, sort of best utilize XR strengths to, t to get people to, to come in and not only get excited about an experience because it's something, you know, really cool. They're seeing the headsets, but also once they're done, you know, with the experience kind of getting excited about uh, following up with your, your company. Well, well, a lot of it was because we're dealing with a lot of, um, you know, PhD level or maybe even grad school level and some undergrads, but it's very science-based. So we made sure that we added a lot of educational pieces in there where they could learn along the way. And then in terms of lead generation, we did things like, uh, you know, the Google Cardboard where we give it away to them and then they could, you know, log on um, and then we could capture their information that way. So they would have it from home, they could use their phone, look through it with the cardboard. And that helped out in terms of the lead generation thing. But the main point was making it educational, um, we say edutainment, make it more fun because in the science world, you know, sometimes it's not as fun. So we, we made it engaging, educational and fun where and we added gamification where we can uh, to have you know these scientists really you know engage with the pieces. So it really is immersive versus the other digital media like videos and different things like that. So that's pretty much how what I've been focusing on in terms of making it giving giving them the education and the wow factor of it. And have you found there to be you know any? Um, sort of retention, you know, increased retention or things like that based on um, the experience in XR versus non-XR? Well, you know, that's the interesting thing. Um, to this point, we haven't necessarily tracked that, but in our, in our future development, we're, we're definitely going to add um, different things like quizzes, um, you know, things like that where we could put into our learning management systems and track them over a period of time. So for example, if they try it day one and they tried it 60 days later, we could track how much better they learned or comprehended from them. So it, it is still a learning piece and project process because it, it, it was difficult in the sense of capturing VR feedback and then you know, we, we didn't really know how to track them later on, you know, sending them surveys and stuff like that. But um, our future development, we're going to build it in, which it'll populate our database and, and we'll have that information. So um, the last three years, more, you know, just getting buy in from our businesses and, you know, customers to come in and try it. And it's beyond the novelty phase. And now we're really going to build in the structure of those type of things where we could make sure that they are learning, not just, you know, having fun with different things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I think something that also comes to mind when we think about um, user experiences is, is storytelling. So I want to kind of shift gears to, um, you know, start with Ali, um, you know, in terms of storytelling, like what has your experience been with capturing an audience through storytelling in XR? Yeah, it's changed the game overall. Um, there's such a personal element. We primarily have done AR. Um, there's such a personal element of AR and the idea that it's augmenting your world. Um, I think as a brand so much, we want to send our message out over and over again. Um, but then there's the question of, well, how do, why does the consumer care about that? Um, and so I think AR has changed the game, XR overall has, um, with that brand storytelling piece. And that's what we've been primarily focused on. Um, is it laddering up to the really engagement that we want to have with our audience? Um, and is it solving the goals that we wanted to? And can you talk a little bit about how uh, specifically you've employed storytelling? You know, what kind of experiences has Coke um, put in AR? Yeah, we've primarily focused on our own platforms. Um, so creating something native. Um, we've done games within our app. Uh, the biggest program we've done to date was uh, last holiday timeframe. 
Um, we use our packaging at, for the first packaging AR experience across the country, um, where we had our iconic polar bears that we all have probably seen from our commercials over the years. Um, we redesigned them overall and reintroduced the family um, to the country. And then you could actually scan the packaging um, on your cans, your bottles, um, and it would have a different experience where you got to know the bears in a new way. Um, and the coolest part about that was, was during the holidays, a time defined by family, friends being together. Um, so there was opportunities to do two packages together with a friend. There was one for you just to engage with yourself and um, it was all about kind of those happy moments um, and really a lot of the kind of core of what Coke stands behind. Um, so all threaded throughout that experience. It's, it's really interesting. I think that Coca-Cola has, you know, this legacy brand and these really interesting characters that engage the consumer. So kind of opening it up to the rest of the panel and, and actually maybe Alex, you can comment, um, you know, can you talk about storytelling or consumer engagement and, and, and how important that is for marketing in XR? So we don't have polar bears at REI, but we're all about saving them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, the um, idea of leveraging that technology to tell a story for us is really about exposing you to our products. The um, tricky part for us is creating digital twins because uh, we have so many different products. Uh, I would imagine for bottles, you would create uh, a model for a can and maybe a two and three liter thing. We have thousands of different items, uh, tens of, of uh, various different configurations and sizes, as well as small little items like carabiners. So the biggest hurdle for us is creating the items to then bring in, to then perhaps tell a story with. Uh, some of the stories per se that we are trying to tell are um, how to compare items together. I don't know if you'd really call that a story, but product comparison tools, as well as um, how to assemble items uh, like tents, which can be complicated to assemble. And if we can offer that in a disconnected environment um, or setup, so they could use their mobile device when they're not connected to the internet and they're out at the campground, uh, something like that is very powerful. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, we're just doing 3D items that you can see from the product page, but uh, we're working on some of those other ambitious concepts. So you talked about digital twins. Um, I think that's a really interesting topic. And I think especially for you know marketing and sales, when you're having folks experience the product itself, um, that's really important. So, you know, is there something out there that you use um, or that, you know, your company is using as sort of like a, you know, a catalog or an arsenal of, of uh, assets? Or is there something that you wish that you had access to um, <laughs> to kind of help with that? Absolutely. I wish I had access to a lot of things. Um, and I'm excited to uh, be with this, uh, with my esteemed um members of the industry here. And one of the things that excites me most about these kinds of conferences is that uh, we could be the um, all, sh all sh ships raised in high seas. What's the old saying there? Um, come on, someone someone help me out. Um, Rising tide raises all ships or something. <laughs> and I really want to help us rise, make the tide rise so we can collectively uh, bring the ball down the field and make some of these things happen. Uh, one of the ones that one of the things that I'm most interested in seeing emerge would be some kind of uh, digital twin syndication platform that enables uh, REI to get assets from some of the other brands that we carry. Like Mountain Hardware, for instance, has hundreds of 3D models. Um, I know that Hoka, uh, their sneaker manufacturer, uh, they also are exploring that space. I learned this because I saw their stuff up on Sketchfab when there should be a platform for retailers to share models, and I should have been in on that already. So I'm just giving you a lens into my frustration. So I wish that there was some kind of open platform to share digital twins. But to even get to the point to have a high quality digital twin um, that ideally would be signed off on and approved before shared on that platform, signed off and approved by the respective uh, company producing it, 
uh, we need to come up with better ways to create these digital twins. Um, there's mobile devices that are LiDAR enabled. You know, you can do an all right digital twin of a small item, but creating a digital twin of a tent is incredibly tricky. Uh, you could use a high quality $20,000 plus Artex scanner, but um, you still have to, at this point, it seems, you still have to manually uh, redo a lot of the elements in that 3D model to make it a smaller uh, file footprint so it can be uh, then converted to a USDZ or GLTF file for the respective environment, uh, USDZ for Apple, GLTF, GLB for Android. Those seem to be the standard file formats. And, and it's great we got to that point where we standardized some of the file formats. But as far as a platform to get those models that we're sharing, uh, we're obviously not there. And as far as easily creating a digital twin of complex items, uh, it is really tricky. And a lot of the uh, agencies that we speak to, uh, to get those models created are pretty ambitious. And they think, yeah, we could build you a tent, no problem. But it ends up being a lot trickier uh, once they get going. Um, ideally, we'd be able to do this in-house. And even more ideally, we would like to be 3D first, uh, enabling our product development team to create the models uh, that we would then use, and we wouldn't have to backwards engineer an already built tent. So uh, there's a lot of um, pluses that would bear fruit from that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Brooks, I know, you know, you're not necessarily kind of doing the same types of, of marketing and um, initiatives that some of the other folks on the panel are doing, but you have a lot of really great knowledge and experience about XR. And, and we've talked about some of the ideas that you've spoken about um, with how XR can kind of facilitate not just the marketing aspect, but like down the sales chain. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, where what has inspired you about um, XR in this space? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, one of the things I don't want to try and do is, is repeat thoughts that I've already put out on the interwebs and, and other places. So um, there's a lot of like common thread that seems to be happening between um, Ali Earl and Alex in terms of um, some of the, the aspects of storytelling that they want to see brought to life, whether that's with consumers or customers, whether that's with um, the people they're trying to sell it to um, before it reaches the customer. So all of these things that, that we're seeing either like an interest in furthering or a problem we're trying to solve um, isn't outside the realm of what I've seen in a lot of things, even outside of XR. So. The pipeline of, of digital assets is one of them. Um, if it starts at, at the source of creation of the product, it then come, almost has this digital legacy that, that stands a better chance at improving the customer um, interaction and the story interaction between customers um, because the, the product that is being put in their hands either in a digital space, I think we're starting to see a majority of our content is consumed online as people are, are frozen in home or, or stuck in home as well as um, you know, trying to, to, to escape smoke. So, um, you know, the digital device becomes really important. And so if a file or an asset or a piece of content is created digitally um, first, that, that allows the first touch point to be really detailed. So one thing Alex was talking about was that, you know, when you're trying to make a replica of something that already exists in space, you have a tough time kind of translating all of those really important design elements into what would eventually be seen on screen. And so, you know, if you use photogrammetry or you use another um, medium to be able to transform this like physical three dimensional object that exists in real space into the digital space, you sometimes lose a lot of the, the interesting design elements that really make that interaction um, powerful or that story really powerful. And so you have a creation space. If it's not done there, you know, then that like then that upstream design and creation space happens, and then you try and digitize it in that middle stream. And so now you're trying to translate from one design language, maybe another medium like two dimension into three dimension, and you start to lose a lot of that information. And so I think a lot of really powerful storytelling that is done in physical space. Um, benefits from a really close and collaborative pipeline between digitally creative 3D files 
whatever space you choose to do that in, and then designing the interaction between the customer or the end user at whatever level um, to really enhance that, that, that effort. And so it's that collaboration that almost improves the probability that your story is going to reach the customer in a really powerful way, or it just stands a better chance. Um, because I, I would say right now in the past, you know, six months since the beginning of, of the pandemic and isolation, um, my uh, content interaction on a digital device is like increased. Uh, I don't know how many fold. And so that's a really noisy environment. And so it's almost more important for, for brands to be able to tell a really compelling story. Um, and if you're using XR, so if you're, if you're trying to um, put it in someone's hand in, in a really democratic way, AR seems to be the best way to do that because there are a lot of devices that then allow you to view it that way. Um, and then if you go into a more immersive VR and if someone is more invested in, in, in the XR space and they have some immersive equipment um, and they're wanting to view content that way, um, it becomes even more imperative that your, your, your design process is really detailed, like the, the detailed design elements that you'd want in a tent or in a coat can, even between like a, a shiny finish and a matte finish that that is is really hard to come across when you're trying to translate it from like here's the actual cam we want you to make a 3d object for versus designing it in a 3d space and so there are, there are a lot of ways that um the xr space can benefit from just improving the collaboration between the design to customer cycle as well as um, improving the collaboration between each one of these groups to ensure that when care is put into it um, it, it is experienced by everyone. So everyone realizes that, you know, it's not just my function that is going to benefit from this and something we can hang our head on, but collectively as a brand, as a group, um, this collaboration will inevitably end in the highest possible chance of the story being told right or the, the experience being delivered in a powerful manner. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, Curious from all of you, you've used different tools, you, you've done um, different things to kind of make, to bring things to light the way that uh, life, the way that Brooks has been talking about. So, um, you know, for folks who are kind of new, you know, how what should they be looking at in terms of tools or, or assets or, or things that, you know, where do they get started? Like, how do they get started with XR? So I'm gonna jump in here. Um... I think it depends on what kind of team they have. Do they have Unity developers and Unreal developers already on board and uh, see people that can code in C Sharp to really uh, throttle something like Unity to be leveraged to create uh, immersive experiences? Uh, Unity now has a, Mar a product called Mars, which is uh, dedicated uh, specifically to AR for mobile, which is really cool. Um, or are you looking for a kind of like a no code solution? Um, Alan Smithson has a uh, company, I think that they're called uh, Metaverse. Uh, they're new on the scene with a no code solution, which looks pretty cool. Uh, Torch was around for a couple of years. Uh, unfortunately, they disbanded, but I was huge on uh, leveraging the Torch SDK. I didn't go to school for engineering. So uh, for me, I'm um, really struggling when I'm inside Unity and I'm on Stack Overflow more than I am in Unity to just unblock myself. Uh, so an SDK like Torch or uh, Apple's uh, Reality uh, Composer or Adobe Aero are all great tools to get in and get going uh, with some rapid prototyping that you can, in some cases, take that rat rapid prototype and go prime time with it. So some of these tools aren't just rapid prototyping, uh, you can actually deploy to uh, the masses with them. So uh, back to the original question, it depends on the team. Uh, Unity and Unreal have uh, robust AR solutions, uh, but that involves coding. And now we're starting to see a lot of uh, no code solutions. There's another one, uh, KP9 Interactive, they're a Canadian company. And um, from what I've seen, they have some very promising stuff as well, so. And I would jump in too to say, kind of get back into what are the goals as well. Like if you want something super turnkey, maybe it's just piloting something with Apple ARKit or even a social media partner with a filter, something that has a really low barrier of entry for your consumer. Um, or if you want to do something larger scale and integrate it into an app, 
then going with a Unity is awesome. You get a lot more range in the experience or a web browser experience, 8 wall. So I think a lot of times it's backing into that as well of what's the engagement that you're looking for and then what's the function and um, capabilities that can really serve that. Yeah, I, I think that's important. Uh, you know, the, the content and what you're going to deploy it as. Um, in my case, I'm a team of one. So I rely heavily on vendors. Um, so in the beginning, you know, I sought out a lot of different vendors. You know, created a proof of concept and just shot it out there. So it was it wasn't cheap, but it wasn't that expensive e either. Just because I wanted to prove the concept, and once the businesses saw the concept and what it was, then they started investing more money to it. And this was uh, four years ago, so it, there wasn't a lot of you know these easy options of you know rapid prototyping that you know Alex was talking about. So you know, if, if you could find a vendor that could do it cheaply, create a proof of concept. For yourself, I mean, and a lot of these vendors will work with you just because they know the business moving forward could be more impressive or more money coming in later on. So that was my experience. And again, like now we have six or seven other teams working on VR, AR, XR stuff, and they have their own vendors too. So, um, you know, in my experience, it is doing that search and looking for a vendor that will work with you and, and do it at a cheaper price just to create that, you know, the POC proof of concept. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there are a lot of different options out there, but I feel like you guys are, you know, you, you guys have tried many of them and um, kind of presenting from your different case studies and, and use cases. Um, but I'm sure that there are, you know, some challenges, like how do you get people to actually experience those experiences that you're creating. And so can some of you talk a little bit about how you've brought people into those experiences um, or, or what have been the biggest challenges getting people to get involved? You know, um, it's interesting. One of REI, one of the things I love about REI is our beautiful print catalogs. Uh, with the Leap to Digital, we're starting to see less and less of that in our world. Uh, we actually just started a magazine called Uncommon Path. So we have a print magazine that we released a few months ago. Um, so we we have always made uh, beautiful print media. Um, I love our catalogs and they look great on a table. So we throttled that with a marker-based um, way to invoke AR uh, for, I think it was holiday 2019, uh, last fall. And uh, that was a hit. Uh, that was in concert with our first uh, AR-enabled products uh, that we uh, included in our mobile app. Uh, so we had an increase of um, viewing specific to the tent that was included in the holiday catalog. Uh, so we went with our old school print media and then catapulted you uh, way into the future with XR. That's awesome. And it's true. You, REI has some great catalogs and, and the visuals are really compelling. And so then when I've seen some of the immersive um, experiences that you guys have created, it, it's, it's like being pulled into the catalog, um, which is really, it's, it's been really cool. Um, and so Ali, maybe you can talk a little bit then about like the, you know, how you can, got consumers um, to get excited, you know, especially because I'm sure a lot of consumers have never used AR. So, you know, what were some of the, the ways that you kind of compelled them to, to have these experiences? Yeah, um, I think Alex made a great point of, it's almost taking inventory of what do you have from a platform perspective or communication messaging experience. So obviously in their case, they have an amazing catalog and direct mail opportunity and, um, a big part of ours was our packaging itself, where obviously the experience was initiated from, but we had a call to action on the packaging. So um, the idea is, you know, you're drinking your Coke, um, your Coke Zero, and you see it on there, um, and that initiates the experience. So that's kind of our baseline. Um, but then it's looking at, is it, you know, using our own um, database? We have some folks um, who are within our platform and um, engage with email with us and leveraging that. Um, we have an owned app. Um, and so really leaning on that as 
in app notifications. Um, and then having media plans around it too, um, and figuring out what that messaging hierarchy is um, to get people involved. There's definitely, I think, a question of, a lot of people don't feel comfortable with AR yet sometimes, um, but it's also, I think, a definition of what AR is to them. A lot of them have already done these filters on an Instagram or Snapchat, so they actually have done it. Um, they just get a little more overwhelmed when they have to go somewhere and scan something and maybe there's an error or things like that. So just accounting for those um, places and the user experience and helping them along the way, I think is the biggest piece um, and making sure that upfront barrier of entry is as open as possible um, and that we make it super easy and intuitive for them to experience it. And I think some of that will come in time, um, but I think there's an opportunity AR for us as well, because AR is definitely one of the most democratized um, XR experiences. I think Brooks mentioned that um, you don't have to have a headset. You can just literally do it from your phone. Um, but for Coke, we have um, consumers who are all across the socioeconomic um, level. So how do you kind of account for folks that maybe don't have the latest um, iPhone and operating system and making sure that they still have an experience when they try to do it and they can't. Um, so I think it's just kind of create, kind of creating experiences based on all of those um, outputs that could be happening um, is probably one of the biggest things top of mind for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that might be a question that, um, you know, other folks have in your organizations. And there are a lot of questions that folks have that, that aren't necessarily um, tuned in with XR. So, you know, the higher ups that kind of approve these things, you know, how, how do you get buy-in from them, especially when they're, they don't really know the full extent of what XR can do? Yeah, well, within my company, um, we're a large organization. So, I mean, well, we have 75,000 people. So, you know, even now, some people don't know what virtual reality is or augmented reality is. So a lot of it is creating the awareness out there um, and showing, you know, the examples and just creating videos of somebody actually putting on a headset and using a phone just to, um, you know, present where it's at. So a lot of the awareness just internally has been a lot of what I've been doing is just sharing um, my experiences I created, putting meetings together. Um, one thing Ellie talked about, about marketing, it, and that's important, just because you have an AR experience doesn't mean it's going to work all the time. You have to put you know, banner ads and send emails out and keep that flow of customers going. And that's where early on, you know, a lot of the businesses I work with didn't do that. So we created for one trade show and then they wouldn't use it again. And I would keep telling them, we can still use this and keep promoting it um, through email, social media and things like that, which you could definitely help in terms of, um, you know, getting customers buy-in and stuff like that. Um, internally, it's been interesting because uh, our company is actually looking forward and, you know, creating more immersive technologies, even though that it didn't have buy-in early on. So now the business leaders at the top down are interested in it because now they see the application such as training. And the, the bottom line is they can see how it can save money or make money. And early on, that's a case that really we didn't have that type of metrics or um, ROI but now we're able to tie it in a little bit more and we're getting a lot more investment and buy-in internally. That's good. Yeah. That's great to hear. Sorry. It's an interesting part that, that Earl brought. No, yeah, that's a, it's an interesting thing that, that Earl brought up and it, it's, again, there's like a lot of connected connection between all of these things, which is um, if you're trying to get senior leadership to buy into something that is slightly nebulous, even now in, in XR, um, you, you almost have to inform leadership of how this isn't just an investment in a one-time thing. Like if you're at a trade show and you invest in physical structures, like a booth, uh, some carpet, that's like a one-time use thing. It's, it's tough for them unless they want it in their office um, to see that thing like continue to, to pay off as an investment. Whereas if you, if you approach it from the standpoint of the reason why we're doing this is to fit this one objective. 
So in, in Alex's case, if it's how do you get consumers to um, understand the benefits of this one tent that's in this one catalog um, to design or to pull those designed um, 3D pieces into a space that allows someone who might have the catalog to then open it up and be like, oh yeah, that's in something interesting I'd like to. And if on the catalog it says, hey, if you have a phone and you put your phone on this QR code and it pulls up this tent and it all of a sudden allows you to interact with the tent in augmented reality and begin to like assemble it, you yourself will figure out how easy it is to assemble this tent. And so now you've shown that, okay, there's an investment that you have to make up front that would allow you to solve perhaps a consumer insight problem, which is people are having a tough time understanding which tents are easier to fold up and which ones aren't. I mean, this happens in, in, in a bunch of different industries, I and mean, you can find a similar problem probably at Coke or uh, in the healthcare industry as well. Um, and so to frame to a senior leader that you're not investing in XR, you're investing in a problem-solving tool that allows people to not only see it as a solve in a customer environment, but it allows your internal people to see that, oh, this will help me better understand how our own products work so then I can design a customer space for a trade show or for a consumer experience, you know, for a holiday. If, if, if Coke's going to do another um, polar bear ad, uh, you know, what are the ways that you can tie that TV ad to that display ad that you see to, you know, a Coke can itself? And that investment in XR is a way for you to really surprise and delight consumers who might not be, you know, immediately going to the XR space whenever they see it. It, it might be something they don't really know much about, but it's an investment in something that you can reap benefits from. Like, like Earl said, you know, both uh, an investment that you can see sales from, but an also a benefit in efficiency gains because your processes become more digitized. You don't have to spend more money on like physical space. Um, and a lot of these things can can be recycled or reused over and over again in the digital space. Those are all great points, uh, Brooks. And uh, Earl, what you said, and then Brooks, what you then elaborated on, uh, comes back to uh, what I refer to as evergreen. The models can be reused uh, and they're good to go uh, minus a product update. And even if the product did change, perhaps we you could just uh, modify the model just a little bit to reflect the change as opposed to rebuilding the, the entire model. Um, so hammering that into senior leadership um, and getting them out of the um, sort of throwaway culture, use once, not reusable kind of mindset is huge in uh, making a case for uh, using XR at your company. Ali, what you were mentioning uh, regarding barrier barrier of entry, um, I think that WebXR is the solution, which um, the, the better that WebXR gets or uh, WebAR specific uh, to using a AR on the browser, um, that's gonna be uh, a big game changer. I think WebXR is getting there, but for some of the more complex uh, 3D experiences in AR, um, I've yet to really see WebXR execute against that. But um, back to what I was saying with a uh, rising tide lifts all boats, I really want to see uh, the industry step up to the plate and uh, get WebXR uh, in parity with uh, native experiences. Um, there are so many uh, different ways you go get wine bottles now and you bring the label to life, I think, and beer cans. And I think it's really neat and it's a way to get people excited about XR. But if you're at the wine shop, you have to select a QR code, go to the app store, download the app. I mean, someone like me would do it. I'm there for like a couple of minutes and I'm nerding out looking at all these things. But I think you really need to make that barrier of entry low and just have it working right away. And, we really need WebXR to um, enable that. And I'm very excited about the future of WebXR for that. Yeah, I'm actually really glad that you brought up WebXR um, because that's something that, you know, I, I personally feel will, will help kind of spread XR uh, more and, and give more people an opportunity to use it because it's true that there is sort of that barrier like if you have to download an app that you don't already have and you know whatever like that that kind of stops you know 
some people from from experiencing it, especially if they don't know the value or the interest, you know, that that comes from um, an XR experience. So I would agree that web XR is really important and really interesting to the future of, of XR experiences. Um, we have a few more minutes, so I just want to get some of your um, sort of last thoughts before Q&A. What uh, do each of you want people to take away from this panel most? What's the key takeaway that you think is most important um, for attendees? And we'll start with Earl. You know, it's interesting. Um, I, I think the one thing is that, um, like Alex was saying and other people were saying, is that there are lower cost ways of getting in nowadays in terms of creating XR um, AR platforms where you could, um, if you're looking to get into XR, you could do it nowadays at a lower cost. I think that's important. Um, my other thing is that, you know, it is the now, not the past and the future. It's just going to keep growing um, in terms of marketing and the usage and, you know, web XR, different things like that. But, uh, but I definitely think, um, you know, in terms of XR, it is going to be growing at a, you know, faster rate than we've seen before. Great. Thank you. Um, Allie, what about you? Yeah, I would say, I mean, just don't be scared to jump in. I had no experience in anything like this two years ago. Um, and the opportunity just came about where we were guts and I raised my hand and my curiosity was able to take me there. Um, so very, I would say just kind of jump in, um, and also kind of take on the responsibility at that point to know you'll be primarily influencing a lot of that moving forward and championing it internally and externally. Um, so, and it's, a, it's an awesome place to be, um, and gain an agency partner too, who can help you in the space. Um, I think all of us are obviously sitting on the, um, in-house side. So we, I, I lean a lot on my agency partners to kind of share the latest um, and keep me up to date too. Um, and there's a lot of ways to just pilot things and try it out. Um, so, Great, thank you. Alex, how about you? Uh, I second what Ali said, uh, just get going, learn your way into it. I've been waiting for this my whole life, I feel like. Ever since I <laughs> Gosh, ever since I can remember, I've been fantasizing about these types of experiences. <laughs> but I love that Ali, um, two years ago, just jumped in and started learning our way into it. And I actually think that we're the same. I, although I had that original passion, we're all just really learning our way in, into this right now. So uh, just go for it and start figuring it out. I am also um, very excited, as I said, about the future of WebXR and um, – trying to get that technology up to where uh, native apps are, as well as the content syndication. I would love to see uh, platforms emerge that handle uh, sharing models safely between uh, companies that do business together. Great, thank you. And Brooks? Yeah, I would say um, whatever the project is, um, keep the primary objectives in mind. Um, the primary objective is going to help guide what platform you use, what element of XR you might use. Um, I, I would say stay away from gimmicks, but really, like gimmicks also have their place. But um, if, if you are going to go down that route, keep an eye on where you want this capability to be for your business, for your function, for your group. Um, because the, the, every opportunity you get to have an objective-based use of XR will be an opportunity for you to invest in a growing capability in XR for your group or, or your company or, or whatever. And so that's kind of how these things um, evolve is that you, you start to build um, on top of one another. Humans are great at iterating, and so if you build an iterative case on top of another objective that you had a while ago, um, you'll start to see – um, the exploration that you have in XR and whatever the new, um, you know, XR space that we'll be talking about next year might be um, keeping it, keeping in mind what that objective is, is not only going to help your case now and whenever the, the project is done, but also in the future as you begin to build a, a capability toward, um, you know, a fully imagined digital XR pipeline like we've talked about here. Absolutely. Those are all really great points. Um, 
Thank you all so much. So now I want to pass it over to the audience and um, we'll be having a Q&A. So audience members, please feel free to throw your questions in and our panelists are here to answer them.